What's up YouTubers, Simon here, welcome to Hammer Talk, and for the first time ever, I'm here chatting to two very special voice actors. One who has played a ninja, an evil genius, and has been part of the comic book world, and the other who's played across many types of animation playing many characters including Betty Boop and in the Sailor Moon universe, as well as being founders for the Love Planet Foundation and H2O and Water With Intention. Please welcome Lex Lang and Sandy Fox. Guys, how are you? That's hey, not. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's so awesome to be talking to you, to people across the other side of the world. I know it's it's amazing what you can do, right? Absolutely. <laughs> thank technology for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so on to the first question. Question for you both. How did you get started in uh, acting? Well, I did as a as a kid. I was always interested in entertaining uh, family members and people on my block. We had uh, a few of the neighborhood children that either played instruments or would do little skits. And I had a good friend who uh, he and I would learn little Monty Python skits and um, do them for the neighborhood. And once we, once I felt that reaction coming from the people who were watching it, I was hooked. And then I got into acting in, in the, kind of in the end of grade school here is about 7th, uh, 8th grade. And then throughout high school and college, I was a stage actor. And I, I went on to do stand-up comedy and on-camera, and from there I uh, got into voiceover. Fantastic. You, Sandy? Uh, well, I my very first play that I ever did, I was um, about eight years old in third grade, was Sleeping Beauty, and I I played Princess Aurora. And um, then in high school, I was asked to audition for uh, the musical Godspell, and that really really got me hooked into acting. Um, I just love the sense of family and working in stage and the ensemble work and it, it just is when I fell in love with acting. So I was about 15 years old and started doing some um, shows at theme parks like Kennywood over the summer and after high school went on to work for Walt Disney at uh, Walt Disney World in Orlando. So I did a lot of stage shows and um, uh, live entertainment um, throughout my years there, and that really kind of, you know, uh, transitioned into radio and voiceover and everything else. So I, I really, my, my first love was working on the stage, and that's when I fell in love with it. That's fantastic. And what was the first uh, voiceover project you ever worked on together? Uh, who's one of the uh, 
Mars Nights uh, in that show. If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. Uh, go check it out. That's absolutely fantastic. And it's great that you still have the projects together and such. And it sounds absolutely brilliant. And Lex, question for you. I remember seeing the face swap impressions video you did, which, by the way, was absolutely fantastic. Did you ever get replies or comments from any of the actors you ever did imp that you did impressions for? Um, <laughs> that would have been great, right? Uh, no, none of the actors, uh, I don't know if any of them saw it, but none took the time to write a note or anything. But that was a lot of fun. I was kind of goofing off with the face swap app and... Um, you know, I made it, 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 it revolves around a beanie in, in a very, you know, it wasn't uh, structured that much. The reason it, it revolves around a beanie is because it only, re it only replaces your face. And so my hair was always my hair and it didn't look like any of the actors. So I put a beanie on my head and I could have Christopher Walken going, wow, you know, your beanie, it's crazy. And I could also have, you know, Mr. T, uh, I pity the fool, the man who wear the beanie. Like I could, I could do a number of them, and I could still look like all of them while I had the beanie on it. I think if I took some time or had a good writer to write some stuff, uh, some content for that face swap app, it would be really fun. So any writers out there, if you want to write a little skit that involves that face swap app and some of those uh, impressions that I do, uh, yeah, send it on over. That's absolutely fantastic. And I especially <laughs> love the Pink Floyd uh, shout-out as well with the Pink Floyd t-shirt, which was yeah. really, really great. <laughs> One of my favorite bands of all time. Mine too. <laughs> and one, one of Lex's niches in Hollywood is that he's um, really well known as a uh, voice match specialist in films and television. So he'll actually go in and when the actor can't come in to uh, do their ADR, their, their post, it. yeah, he will be called in or auditioned to do sound alikes and things like that. Fantastic. Who are some of the characters you've done? Uh, just recently, I did Antonio Banderas again. I've been I've done him many times over the years. Uh, I just uh, voice matched Sylvester Stallone for um, the Creed movie. Um, I just did um, Ryan Gosling for uh, a movie coming out called La La Land, um, and a variety. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. I've the done. Marvel. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, also, a lot of creatures, too. I do, do a lot of creatures, everything from the apes and Planet of the Apes to um, the, the creatures in X-Men, and I do the, the demons and the, the zombies and everything like that in Constantine, the TV show, and uh, wraiths and hawk people in Legends of Tomorrow and The Flash. So, yeah, it's, a, it's quite an interesting life when you're doing sound effects and, and making your voice sound uh, Inhuman. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. And Sandy, would you ever see yourself doing something similar to that, like doing the face swap thing that Lex uh, did himself? Um, I'm not really one that does impersonations or anything like that, so um, that's really not one of my gifts. Um, but I, I certainly love watching it. But <laughs> Sandy's gift is just a super duper cute voice. Yeah, I do lots of. <laughs> Characters. characters yeah I like to do characters yeah that's fantastic and Lex one of the roles I remembered you playing the most was Sonosuke Sagara from uh, Rurouni Kenshin what was it like her uh, doing that show uh, it was one of the first big anime shows that I did it had hundreds of episodes I think it was like 120 episodes and it was really neat because <clears throat> it allowed me to get into the character and really see parts of that character that I related to that, you know, he stood for the underdog and, and even though he was a fighter, there was a part of him that, you know, wanted to, 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 to be strong in character more than strong in his physicality. And we did it over the course of four years, I think. So, you know, I'd work, I'd do three or four episodes, I'd come back a month and a half later, do three, four more episodes. And uh, with anime, we're in the booth alone, so we're not reacting or, or talking to other cast members when we're recording our parts, when we're doing our acting. So we usually will preview the Japanese, and we'll also be able to um, sense what their emotional content is. And from that point, um, 
we'll we will act and you know it's a technical thing because we have to match the lip flaps because it's a show that's come in that's already been animated it's very different than doing other shows so with Kenshin it was a, a learning experience for me too because it enabled me to to establish my chops in terms of doing foreign dubbing so that was really good as well that's absolutely fantastic and it's one of my absolute favorite anime shows and I still watch it to this day forward and it's absolutely brilliant well we have a little piece trivia for you. Um, I, I dubbed the English um, opening song, and Lex actually dubbed the closing song. <laughs> so if you watch the English version, uh, especially the first two volumes, I think, Sandy is singing the... Freckles. The, yeah, the, the, freckles. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then I'm singing the uh, tactics. tactics at the end. That's absolutely fantastic. And Sandy, one of the roles I remembered you playing the most was uh, Sumomo from Chobits. What was it like uh, doing that show? That was one of my favorite roles, and it was such a fun show. That was actually a show that Eric Sherman, the founder of um, Bang Zoom Entertainment, was directing at the time. And it was just so much fun. Yeah, I really loved Sumomo. She was fun and light, and that show was just kind of silly crazy. <laughs> but um, I really enjoyed doing that show, and I still, to this day, probably been, what, 15 years later, um, I probably sign as many Chobits autographs as I sign any of my other characters, so it's still, it's kind of, well, everything's kind of having a comeback, a resurgence from the 90s, so that's really exciting for us, because mm. we were in so many of those shows before anime was really big, and now they're replaying them, or, you know, uh, putting them back up online, so... So yeah, so Momo's one of my favorite characters, and, it, and, it, and my characters do have a common theme. They're all, a lot of my characters, I'd have to say most of my characters have pink hair, and they're pink and cute and lovable, so that's kind of fun for me. That's fantastic. And yeah, Chobos was definitely a really great series. I actually always thought of it as like uh, uh, the Robin Williams movie, Bicentennial Man, an anime version of that movie. Yeah, it's a Who Robin. Who was in that? Who it, was in that? Uh, Robin, uh, Robin Williams. It was one of. Oh, Ro Robin Williams. I've always Robin thought of it as like a version of that somehow. <laughs> and uh, you also voiced alongside uh, Crispin Freeman and Michelle Ruff in Showbits, but you also voiced alongside those same two actors in other shows as well, like uh, Ghost in the Shell, for example. Yes, uh huh. Ghost in the Shell. That was so much fun. That was another um, project. One of the first projects that came out of um, the ZRO studios, and um, I was a Tachikoma. A lot, there were a lot of us uh, women, female voice actors that were Tachikomas. And I recently uh, recorded the voice of the Tachikoma in the new Ghost in the Shell first assault game. So that was really exciting. And um, uh, and Crispin, I've worked with Crispin on several projects, but Michelle mostly. Michelle and I are kind of playing opposite characters in the new Durarara. Ra. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that yet, um, but uh, our characters interact a lot in that show. And there was a show um, quite a while ago, and it's kind of out of print, I believe, but it's called Risky Safety. And I played Risky, kind of like the little devil on your shoulder, and um, Michelle Ruff played um, Stacy, the little angel. So that that whole show, we were uh, we worked together. But but like Lex said, you don't really work together because you're by yourself in the booth, but you're actually in this cast of you know of characters. But we don't really get to see each other or perform together, or perform off of each other. And, and Crispin and Michelle are, are just, you know, two of, say, a hundred really talented people that make the bed of actors that do anime and other animated stuff here in Los Angeles, maybe even 200 actors. Um, and so we see them a lot, and we're in, we, we, we share, like, a community with each other. But when we're doing anime, like Sandy said, we, we rarely are doing it at the same time. We usually are exchanging hugs in the hall as we pass each other, catching up for 30 seconds, you know, um, whenever we bump into each other. But 
but they've been doing it for years and years and years. So, you know, we probably, that group of 200 people probably have, you know, 50 overlapping shows that they've all been in. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, but, uh, you, but obviously you also catch up with like a lot of the guests, uh, usually at conventions sometimes, depending yeah. on who's there. So, yeah, we do that. that. That's when we really get to spend some time together. We are lucky enough to do conventions together. Conventions, panels, uh, rap parties. We get to see each other at a rap party once in a while. That's yeah. fantastic. And now, Lex, one of your most famous roles to date is Dr. Cortex from Crash Bandicoot. What was it like uh, playing the character? Oh, yes, Dr. Cortex. Um... <laughs> Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, there were a couple of Cortexes before me that didn't have quite a lot of dialogue, but uh, the last one before me was Clancy Brown. And uh, when I auditioned for it, I auditioned as a voice match to Clancy's Cortex. That's the first thing they wanted is, you know, uh, the gems are mine, you know, like really uh, kind of a match. And, and then when I got to the studio, they said, you know, they wanted to bring some light to the character. Uh, it was getting reviews as just a little too serious, a little too mean. And so we said, let's keep him mean, but let's make him uh, mega maniacal uh, so that he had, he was a narcissist who was also very flamboyant. And so we made him a lot lighter in terms of... Uh, Oh, yes, he's doing a lot of this now, you know, like he's got a lot of kind of uh, fun that happens as part of his character. That's absolutely fantastic. And did you ever get the chance to, like, um, interact with the previous voice actors of, uh, of Cortex or receive any compliments from, uh, at any point when you were playing the character? I would, uh, yeah, when I started, uh, Clancy Brown had just finished and we were on a Justice League Unlimited together and... Uh, I told him that I had gotten Cortex, and he had left it, so he, it wasn't like he was, you know, uh, still wanting to do it. He had, he had chosen to not do it anymore, and uh, he wished me luck, and he, uh, you know, he, he's a very friendly guy, so we became friends on, on that job, and uh, he knew that he was inspiration for me on that. That's So, yeah, he's, he's pretty nice. <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. And speaking about, of course, with video games, a huge congratulations on E3, which was last week. And you've made some really big announcements uh, at the convention. Uh, yeah, start you, with your, the yeah go ahead. Do you want to do that, Sandy? Yeah, I'll start with some of the new games that I um, uh, recorded that are, that are out or coming out now or announced. One is um, I play a character, Aisha and El Sword. And um, so that's, that's a new game. Also, um, I recorded the latest um, PC and Yellowheart in the latest Neptunia game, the, the newest uh, Hyperdimension Neptunia. And then uh, also there's a new game, um, you've probably seen it, uh, Brave, um, Bravely's Second End Layer. And I mean, I mean Net Capnati, the little cat man. So that's also um, a sequel to the first um, Bravely Second. So those are some new games that I can talk about. There's a couple other new ones, of course, we can't talk about yet. But <laughs> yeah, I thought I was going to have more to be able to say after E3, but um, they just made some preliminary announcements that didn't include <laughs> the characters I wanted to announce about. But um, so, um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of games, and it's good. You know, Titanfall 2 is coming out. I'm able to say that. Um, I am, I'm going to re re reprise my role as Spyglass in that. And I, I'm playing a couple other characters that I can't say, but I, I got to play two other characters. And um, I, I also recently uh, did a, another Skylanders game, and I got to reprise a character that I've done before. Um, and that is going to be a lot of fun when they announce that. And then um, I also am going to be announcing in about four weeks a new character in Guild Wars that I'll be able to talk about um, as well. And also something new in World of Warcraft coming. So um, that's about as much as I can uh, you know, 
let out of the bag at the moment. That's perfectly um, right. But that's fantastic, though. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah, uh, just for your audience's purposes, Simon, um, when you work on these big games, they want to strategically release announcements uh, for publicity purposes. And um, so we have to sign NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, that we will not reveal the characters we've recorded until after they've announced. So that's mm. kind of, you know, that's pretty standard in our industry, but especially in the gaming industry, I would say. Not always for television, right. um, things like that, but but mostly for film and, and video games. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good, though. But, of course, um, Lex, as you mentioned before with uh, the Justice League, you've played across the the whole Marvel DC world in various shows, as you mentioned with uh, Justice League, of course in Batman and Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. What was it like stepping into that world? And were you familiar with uh, Marvel and DC before you started the roles? I was familiar with, but not deep into. I mean, of course, everybody loves Batman and loves superheroes. And, you know, throughout my life, I've seen all the movies and, and TV shows. And, and the Batman, the animated series, was one of my favorites uh, as a young adult I would watch that a lot and uh, so I was really hooked to that Warner Brothers style of, of animation Bruce Tim is uh, you know just one of the greats out there and he he has you know he, he's locked in that style for Warner Brothers on how to present the, the Marvel and DC universe you know uh, so for me stepping into that world was kind of like, you know, half half excitement because of the acting role that I get to play, but the other half is exciting just to be in the same room as all these other people. You know, Kevin Conroy sitting there playing Batman, uh, you know, um, Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor in the room, uh, Ed Asner playing, uh, 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 you know, big characters and Brooke Shields and other people sitting in the room. So. It's really like you pinch yourself, and, and for me personally, I just sat there and was feeling blessed and really grateful for, you know, the opportunity to, to be an actor among these other actors that I admire. That's absolutely fantastic. S Sandy, would you ever see yourself playing uh, in the Marvel DC world? And if so, which character would you see yourself playing? Well, I was looking at that question, and I, I don't know if, um, uh, if I saw myself actually in the Marvel world, but I will tell you some of the abilities that I love of some of my favorite characters. Of course, I you know I, I am very intuitive, and so I love the psychic, um, telekinetic abilities of Jean Grey. And then I also like Black Cat. She used to be a cheerleader, <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cool. And then she took martial arts, and she took all those abilities, and um, and also Black Widow's just. So I love those characters, um, but I, I'm really not sure how I would fit into the Marvel universe. Maybe an avatar of one of those or something. <laughs> <laughs> I can Wonder definitely see that. Wonder Woman. That's true. I multitask <laughs> quite a bit. Maybe Power Girl, my man. Yeah, maybe. That's fantastic. Maybe one, I, I did. I grew up. One of the characters I loved growing up was Wonder Woman. When uh, watching. Uh, Oh my, Linda, Linda Carter. Carter, yeah, that was one of my childhood shows, and I did love watching Wonder Woman, and I do multitask quite a bit. She'd be like one, a Wonder Teen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no. Susan uh, Eisenberg, right? She does, she does yes. the voice of Wonder Woman. She has a fantastic Wonder Woman yeah, voice. Yeah, she's, she's great. great. Yeah, I, I can definitely picture like a, a Justice League avatar, a small avatar series at some point. <laughs> that would be really cool. That, that would be... That That would, de that would definitely be fantastic indeed. And, but Sandy, one of your most famous roles to date is Betty Boop. What has it been like playing one of the most famous cartoon characters of all time? Well, I'll tell you, it really is an honor and I'm very humbled for all the years and I'm still currently voicing uh, Betty Boop for projects. But um, I, I started, you know, how I got into so interesting. I was working for the Walt Disney Company, and I was actually in my evenings I, to make extra money. I was working at a 
uh, it's kind of like an Irish kind of pub slash food place called Bennigan's. Uh, it's like a food chain here in the U.S. And I, I was um, I was only like 18 years old and I was um, the hostess. So I would go on the microphone for the last call for alcohol. Last call for alcohol. It's a 2.30 call for drinks. And this man walked up to me and his name was Spoons Tirico. And he said, oh my gosh, you sound just like Helen Kane. And I didn't know who Helen Kane was. And she was this very famous pop singer of the 1920s who was actually one of the many voices of Betty Boop. So um, he said, will you come audition for my orchestra? And I said, sure. He asked me if I sang. I said, yes. So I went and I started singing that music and traveling with this orchestra and for about 11 years called the Coconut Manor Orchestra in Orlando. And it, it opened me up. First of all, it was this whole genre of 1920s jazz, very specific jazz that these women who voiced Betty Boop sang. So I got to sing a lot of those songs and then I got to sing a lot of the Betty Boop songs. And um, that's really where I started voicing Betty Boop. And then if someone at some point said, could you dress up like her for the event? And then uh, Universal Studios Hollywood had auditions for like a living Betty Boop. And so I auditioned for Universal Studios Hollywood and that's how I got from Florida to California. I got the job. And my first two years were doing nothing but radio, television, touring, publicity for the theme park. So that's really, and I was approved by King Features Syndicate in New York to do the character. So I really started doing Betty in the 90s and then started transitioning into new voice projects that are, were popping up because there wasn't really a series or anything. But I did a commercial for Lancome uh, in Paris, and they flew me to Paris, and I voiced Betty there. Um, I've done some other projects for King Syndicate. I just finished recording five of the new Betty Boop singing plush toys, and they're so cute and so beautiful and well-made. And they have like a 60-second song with each toy. And Lex and I actually uh, wrote a couple of the songs. So that was really exciting. So those are, those. Uh, I think three of the five are available now online at shantillylane.com. Uh, uh, or you can find them on Amazon as well. But yeah, and I, I just recorded a couple other television Betty Boop uh, projects that I can't talk about yet, but you'll see them in 2017. So it's very exciting, and I'm completely honored and humbled to be able to voice her because she is the queen of cartoons and she's the very first talking cartoon and i'm so glad she's making a comeback <laughs> that's absolutely fantastic and it's great to see that you you're carrying on the legacy of like one of the most famous cartoon characters of all time and oh absolutely yeah mm, that's really great to hear now out of out of all the roles that you both have done out of all the roles that you've both have done in terms of your careers as, vo as voice actors, what has been the one role that has resonated with you the most and you feel like you could relate to as, as people? Well, that's hard, to, that's hard to choose one. There's been so many that have different characteristics that are, you know, admirable. Um, geez, you know, I, I have to think about that one uh, for another second. <clears throat> um, I can talk about a yeah, couple. Yeah. Um, I really resonate. I am resonating with Chibi Yusa and Sailor Moon's her her journey. Um, I I often refer in my panels to Sailor Moon as like um, one of the Star Wars of anime because I really think that the archetypal characters and the journey of of Usagi and Chibiusa in the story is so amazing, but um, I really resonated. Um, a lot of my childhood, I was kind of thrown into situations on my own, and um, because you know my parents weren't always available, and um, you know I, I I do get cast in a lot of roles where the kids are like orphans, or perhaps they are kind of 
thrown into situations where they have to be an adult even though they're a child. So I, re I really do find in certain scripts you'll see things and go, wow, I can relate to that. I've lived that. I know what that feels like. And, um, and there's no coincidence that we get cast in some of these roles and we're able to bring some part of our real life experience to that character. So I would say that for my characters, what about you? Yeah, um, it's a little different for me because often, because I have a low voice and uh, I play a variety of different kinds of characters, I'm playing characters that are like really evil. So for me, it's it's not so much that I relate to the evil; it's more that I get to, you know, become this character that I, that I personally am not, uh, or or that. You know, I personally have deep inside that I access for the character and for nothing else. You know, and, and the same goes for very friendly characters as well. Like for I played the doorman and his dog Hundley on a show called Curious George. It's a children's show, and you know that's just like the sweetest, friendliest guy who's just concerned with keeping his lobby clean and and taking care of his dog, and, and he loves George. And, He's just the friendliest guy, and he talks like this. Isn't that right, George? Let's keep that lobby clean. You know, and, and it's you know real fun to play those kinds of characters, and you know I can relate to the feeling you get inside when you're dealing with children and the innocence in their eyes and and the you know untainted view of the world and how they're just they have that wonder still alive, you know, and so. Those are motivations for it as well. That's absolutely And uh, Lex fantastic. mentioned the evil characters. You know, in Sailor Moon, um, there's a transition of Chibiusa into into Black Lady. And um, I usually don't get cast into those evil kind of dark characters. But it's really interesting because how she, she kind of gets uh, hypnotized um, by wise men and, and, and just told that everything's, uh, you know, her fault and that, they, you know, they were working against her. It's like, it's almost like she's overcome by her own dark negative thoughts. And so it's really interesting how that, how that can happen to all of us, you know. And I really related to, you know, how, how that has sometimes affected my own life, you know, just believing, you know, the negativity or, you know, buying into some of those negative thoughts and how that can, how that can change you and, and darken you. So it was, it was really interesting. It's a very interesting show. Uh, I finished um, the first part of Crystal. I'm still recording. Um, we're on a little hiatus right now, but um, they're actually doing the full series. They're, they're keeping to the story and the manga, which is so exciting. And um, to the, the true story of the manga, they're not adapting or changing anything uh, for social reasons. So um, it's it's such an exciting project, and, and I love that uh, you know the majority of the show is women. Even all the evil characters are women. So it's kind of a cool thing in Hollywood that so many characters are voiced by by women. So yeah, I just love being a part of the Sailor Moon uh, world. That's absolutely fantastic. And also, what I was going to get into as well, with um, a lot of the projects you have right now, of course, with, uh, like you mentioned on social media, Lex, one of the roles that actually struck out to me the most was uh, Jagged Stone, which is part of Nickelodeon's Miraculous Ladybug, which... Right, uh, right, Jagged Stone, a rocker. He's a, he's a rock star, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> which, now brown M&M. Yeah, <laughs> which I always thought of like uh, as a cross between uh, I think Prince and uh, Frank Zappa for some reason. What was it? <laughs> what was it like uh, doing that show? That's a great show. It's a little different because the style of how it's dubbed is uh, on a ribbon. They call it R I B B O N, a ribbon that instead of having beeps, you see the dialogue fly past the line that's in the center of the screen, and the dialogue comes. <laughs> flying by and you act while you're reading the dialogue that it's you know zipping by at, you know 50 miles an hour that's French animation <laughs> yeah, French I, I French had to do, ribbon animation yeah I had to do that as well when I when I did Betty's role in France so it's interesting but 
the the show itself, Ezra Wise is directing that show, and it's a fantastic, fun time. And Christina V and Bryce Tappenbrook are doing an amazing job as the two leads. It's a really great show. That's absolutely fantastic. And with Sandy, as you mentioned a few times before, being part of the Sailor Moon universe, how did it feel stepping into that sort of universe when you got the two roles? Oh, it was so exciting. Um, that was one of the projects when I was asked to audition. Um, I literally had to sign the, the non-disclosure before I even auditioned, and I, I wasn't told what I was auditioning for. So, um, it, you know, I wasn't sure what I was actually reading for, and um, I wasn't, I didn't, you know, I'm a little bit older, so I didn't grow up with the Sailor Moon world, the 90s Sailor Moon. But um, when I auditioned for it, and after I found out the show that I got, I was so excited. And then when I think I really felt the power of Sailor Moon and the impact of that around the world. When I first started recording and then seeing that first year when um, I was introduced at Anime Expo on Sailor Moon Day, um, just the impact and how the show has reached so many people and united so many different kinds of social circles and age groups and every, you know races everything it's just such a universal um, you know project it just reaches the hearts of so many people so I, I'm still like Betty Boo very humbled to be playing Chief Yusa um, I'm kind of just diving into the story as we go and I, I want to as an actor I don't want to like study Sailor Moon, the series, I want to experience it and voice it as I'm going along, so it's much more organic experience for me. That's so, absolutely yes, fantastic. very exciting, very yeah. exciting. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, And, as, and aside from, uh, from acting, as you mentioned uh, a few times, of course, you're also musicians as well, where Lex, you've played in various bands over the years, such as your own band called Lex Lang, and the Velvet Box, and you've sung in the several anime, as you mentioned, with uh, the Rurouni Kenshin series, and also have an acoustic duo with uh, Sandy called Butterfly. You Are you both uh, still involved in uh, music? Yeah, we are. Um, like Sandy mentioned, we wrote a couple of the songs for uh, these Betty Boop uh, uh -huh. plush dolls that came out. I'm also in a recording project that's been ongoing for a couple of years now uh, that is called Otis 9, O-T-I-S number 9, and it's otis9.com, and it's basically all the Flo all the Pink Floyd um, influences over my life, uh, if they all spilled out in one instrumental band project, that this would be it. Uh, so it's, it's instrumental, and it's uh, very, very Floydian. We, we have a Twitter it's called following at following Floyd, and um, I think people who like Pink Floyd will really like it, and hopefully we'll have some releases uh, at the beginning of 2017. That's fantastic. That's and some cool. of the I've, I also recorded the music for Magic Night Ray Earth in the 90s, and I'm always suggesting to producers because um, there's so many more and more new uh, voice actors and actresses coming up, but that you know I'd love to more anime uh, theme songs dubbed because I think um, that's something that they kind of skip over and I think it'd be cool to have an option on the DVD or on the series to have like anime songs dubbed but yeah we write music projects come up and we'll be asked to write a kid song or a theme song and uh, we still we still are very much involved in music that's absolutely fantastic and that's really great to hear and you're also founders for the uh, Love Planet Foundation and H2O and Water with Intention. What inspired you guys to start these projects? Well, I'll start with the, uh, the Love Planet Foundation. Uh, I believe the Love Planet Foundation started back in 2001. And this was um, before the whole Go Green movement and the whole green marketing kind of movement. And I've always, I personally have always been very, very involved in uh, uh, environmental activism. Um, sometimes if you check out my Twitter, you might see, or my Facebook, you'll see how passionate I am about um, policies that protect our planet and our water and clean air. 
care and what we're going to be leaving our next generation. And I really feel that the key to change is education and awareness. So in 2001, we started the Love Planet Foundation because we figured we're in media. We have access to, you know, be able to produce film, television, live events, or go in even as voice actors that we are to go into schools and talk to kids about the environment. And that's basically what that is. Um, Lex and I have gone in and talked about, um, you know, done special talks on water and world water awareness because our planet is 75% water. So um, it's, it's a really important um, aspect of our, of our talk. But it's really being able to create projects that the power of, you know, entertainment, film, television can have an impact on the masses. So, uh, yeah, we started that back in 2001, and we still have it, and we're working on this puppet show, this really cool puppet and um, multimedia show for kids on water. So that's something that, you know, we're currently working on. And then you went to talk about H2O? Yeah, the, <laughs> the, uh, the other company is called H2O. Oh. Um, Similar to when people meditate, they, they make the sound om. <clears throat> and uh, that was actually, let's see, that we started that business 10 years ago. And it, <clears throat> it, after a series of very synchronistic events and a very powerful dream, uh, Sandy and I opened H2O Water with Intention. And it's basically a, a natural spring water company where we put words on the label that encourage you to create intention as part of your day with the themes of love, gratitude, prosperity, perfect health, willpower, joy, and peace. So we, our slogan is think it while you drink it. So if you're having one of the uh, intentions like the peace intention, you just set your mind on peace and let it inspire you to take peaceful actions throughout your day or whatever you know you, it's different for everybody it's very subjective but it's a it's a nice place to be reminded of those values and and um, you know really have really good natural spring water at the same time and because people usually have a you know a bottle of water in their hand you know even more than a newspaper anymore because we it's either our, our cell phone or a bottle of water Know, we thought that could be a kind of a message in a bottle to get um, spread positive uh, words and intentions around the world. So that's the goal of it. Um, right now we're working with the Chopra Center, Deepak Chopra and the Chopra Center down in uh, La Costa in San Diego. And we've also been uh, studying meditation, yoga, Ayurvedic lifestyle, perfect health. And so Lex and I became certified meditation teachers. And that's also something I'm very passionate about sharing with kids. And um, and then we're studying, we're continuing our study there. So it's taken us on. It's a practice. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's something that once you get the information, practicing it is where you see your benefits. That's absolutely inspirational. And that's fantastic. And the... Uh, if I could honestly um, bring those sort of value, if I could bring those sort of values into the, because I'm a teacher myself, and of course I'm a musician too myself, if I could honestly bring the values that you guys have into everyone, into all the people that I teach, and to everyone that I play to, everyone across the globe, I think the world would be a much better place to live in right now. It's absolutely inspirational. Yeah, and, and you know, they always say change begins with me, you know, peace begins within and so that's really I mean we can't control the events of the world we can't control nature but we can you know um, control our thoughts and where we decide where we choose to place our attention so um, like Buddha says you know um, with your thoughts this is what you become you know so it's very be mindful. So it's really a, a practice of mindfulness. It's an ancient practice, you know, thousands and thousands of years. So um, I think it's great that it's coming back into our mainstream consciousness now. It's returning, and more and more people are are open to it. It's not religious, or it's you know, it's basically a, a practice for holistic living um, and balancing our lives. So 
know, that's what's really exciting about it for me. That's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and on to the uh, last question. What do you think that Dr. Cortex and Betty Boop would say if they saw kangaroos? Dr. Cortex, he'd probably say, um, <clears throat> say what was Cortex? <clears throat> oh no, not another menacing marsupial. Don't tell me your name's Joey. Or is it Boomer? No, <laughs> I've guessed it, Rue. I've got a pair of shoes named after you. But they're a bit bodgy. <laughs> You're really the Easter Bunny, aren't you? Oh, Auntie, I'm not the Easter Bunny. I'm Betty Roo. Boop boop be boing, moing, moing. Boop boop be boing, moing, moing. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's absolutely brilliant. Lex Lang and Sandy Fox, thank you both so much indeed. It's been an absolute honor to talk to the both of you. Well, thank you, Simon. Sorry it took a while to get to it. I know you've been trying diligently for quite some time now and I'm glad we were able to coordinate our, our time together. Thank you, Simon. Thank you both so much and I hope to see you in Australia someday. Well, guys, Thanks. if you'd like to find out more about Lex Lang and Sandy Fox, you can check out their official websites, Facebook and Twitter with links down below in the description. And don't forget to subscribe down below to Hammer Talk as well as subscribe to Simon Hammer Music and follow me on both Facebook and Twitter and check out my official website with links again down below in the description. Thank you guys so much for listening. This is Simon signing off. <laughs>